so I'd like to present you a few a few view and analysis about uh, uh, industrialization and development in, in Asia. Uh, um, very probably you know already a few or a lot of the things I am going to, to show you. So maybe the, um, uh, the talk could be more uh, intensive later. Uh, so I will start with one question. Uh, in the developing world, yes? Uh, I'm sorry, can you speak a little? I try to be sure. <laughs> uh, I can try. <laughs> Otherwise, you can come uh, closer. Uh, so in the developing world, since uh, mid um, uh, 20th century or the 50s, what has been the main, uh, the main change uh, in the developing world, in the third world, you call it uh, when you want, uh, how you want? Uh, in fact, th of course, there have been a lot of uh, events, uh, uh, a lot of uh, changes, but um, for sure the main one, the most impressive one, the most uh, definitive one has been uh, the growth, the growth of a lot economic growth and development in a lot of countries in East Asia. So this uh, picture is not completely clear. It show you it show you the trends of two of the uh, let's say uh, earlier earlier um, new developing countries, which are uh, South Korea, so it's in French, and Taiwan. Uh, this is the GDP per capita in, in uh, relatively to the US uh, level. Okay. So in the 60s, <laughs> this is the third world period. Okay. Everybody is poor, everywhere, roughly. Uh, this is the case in Asia, this is the case in uh, Latin America, North Africa, and so on. Okay. So the, the in terms of uh, income level, every everybody is very low. Uh, then you have a uh, fast change for a few countries. What is, um, uh, let's say, uh, remarkable is not, uh, are not these flat trends. And this is the average income level by head in uh, Latin America and here uh, in North Africa. As you can see, in terms of uh, initial conditions, initial conditions, the income levels were higher than in most countries in Asia. Okay. Uh, the change has been the growth first of these um, newcomers, uh, South Korea and Taiwan. And then, boy, it's <laughs> less obvious to, to, to observe it on this, on this graph, but it's also the case of other Asian countries, uh, such as China here, uh, and even very poor uh, Asian countries, such as uh, Vietnam or, Vietnam or uh, Cambodia, uh, started later um, uh, a new a new growth trend, okay. while in the rest, on average, of course, huh, in the rest of the developing world, South America, uh, North Africa, or even uh, or even Africa, not on this uh, not on this graph, the average income level in relative terms, huh, relatively to the U.S. level, so in terms of catching up, reducing the, the income gap, uh, there has been almost no no change. Huh, the, the position, the status. Is still the same, so you have two two uh, uh, two way of um, of uh, of looking at this kind of graph. Whether <laughs> you look preferably to the growth uh, experiences, then try to understand what happens, or to look at the um, countries without significant growth income growth uh, experiences and try to find out what happened. So the focus here is more on the uh, at the uh, growing countries, uh, on, the, on the developing countries. And uh, I, I will try to, to provide you a short explanation of uh, this, uh, this success in the, the econ this economic success in, in Asia. Uh, it might be useful because during a long time, and I'm not sure it's finished, the explanation uh, the explanation of this fast growth process, uh, which have, as you, as you saw before, 
are relatively exceptional, were presented either as a mirage or miracle. Uh, a mirage, so something not really sound, not really uh, 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 an economic uh, a growth process, not really sustainable, uh, very fragile, or uh, uh, a miracle. So miracle does mean we don't have any explanation, there is no model, uh, there is nothing to learn from these experiences. Okay. And I'd like to, uh, to change a little bit this, uh, this perspective. Um, the in the Western countries, uh, mainly in the US but also in Europe, the, the analysis of East Asian uh, countries has, um, has a change very, very um, abruptly from uh, a very positive view, optimistic view, and then to much more pessimistic view, uh, with a change like this. So in the early uh, 60s, for instance, the Asia, Asian countries, Asian development was, was considered as a drama uh, by Myrdal, one of the very famous development economists, for reasons I will explain later. Uh, late in the 80s, because, because of the start of the growth of the Taiwanese, Korean, uh, Hong Kong, Singaporean exports, a uh, few, <laughs> a few uh, clever uh, observers I in the US mainly um, uh, saw that something was happen happening in, in Asia. And the, the mood changed considerably from a very uh, pessimistic view to a much more, uh, much more uh, positive one. So the book of Amzen, uh, at the end of the 80s, uh, Asia's next giant, next giant was after Japan. Okay, so, so the second giant uh, in Asia after Japan. It was not uh, China at this time, it was South Korea. Because ch the Chinese growth had already started, started 10 years before, uh, in, the, in the late uh, 70s. But nobody knew that at this time. And uh, this uh, very optimistic view culminated with the uh, uh, 93 World Bank uh, famous report, the East Asian Miracle, uh, which was a kind of uh, synthesis, a new Bible trying to explain, to describe uh, the success of this, um, the reason behind this success in East Asia, uh, which is a little bit um, unsatisfying. But, so the view was still uh, optimistic, but then, uh, quite fast, uh, unlucky, the uh, Asian financial crisis uh, happened, uh, and the view uh, fall uh, down to a much more uh, pessimistic one, which books such as uh, the MacLeod books, uh, from being a miracle to needing one, because for countries such, such as, as Thailand, uh, Korea, South Korea, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, the, the recession was behind minus 5 and minus 10% in 98, a very deep one. And then recovery, recovery in the, in the very fast but roughly early 2000. And now the picture is uh, much more, uh, there is much more emphasis on the, uh, on the, the growth, on the, the size of the market, the renaissance, so this, this was the title of a book of the World Bank and the East Asian Renaissance. Uh, and since then, there has been, uh, we will continue with this view. But what is, uh, what is um, uh, a little bit disturbing is this capacity of Western observers and uh, very, very um, <coughs> famous, very well installed in the, in the, in the picture, uh, to change their view like this, okay, from a, a, a red one to a green one and so on. Well, so it has not really provided a clear, <laughs> a clear explanation of uh, this, uh, this success. Uh, one of the reasons of, reason of this difficulty of the, uh, let's say, uh, professional economist uh, to understand and to provide a, a, a clear or clever, uh, a, a relevant explanation of this process has been uh, First, that these takeoffs were not expected at all. They were completely unexpected, uh, completely unexpected. 
uh, everybody had this view uh, that considered that East Asian countries in the 60s would stay in this area, very low income countries, uh, for a lot of uh, different reasons that uh, have been uh, aggregated or uh, accumulated reason, uh, cumulative process. Uh, and in fact, in the early 60s, it was true that uh, East Asian countries were very poor. And South Korea, for instance, was much poorer in terms of income level than uh, most African, uh, sub -Saharan, sub saharan African countries. Uh, in Taiwan, the income level was lower than in Brazil, four times lower than in Argentina, for instance, in the 60s. And the dominant view about Asian economies was uh, what was called an Asian pessimism. Uh, Asian pessimism, and it was rather uh, unanimous. Huh? And uh, in a more uh, in a wider perspective, most of the professional economists consider that the, what was called then the third world was not uh, in a very uh, good shape and that growth and economic development would be very, very difficult for, let's say, two major reasons. One reason was uh, the, the weight of the demography, uh, the weight of, the, uh, of the, um, the size of the population and the, grow and the growth of the population. And the other uh, um, negative, uh, negative factor, structural factor, was the uh, inability of the of the third world, of the poor countries, to follow, uh, to catch up and to follow uh, technical, uh, the technical progress. Huh? So two main barriers to economic development, the, the weight of the, de of the demography and uh, the lack, the gap, the technological gap that should expand and not uh, narrow. For instance, in the case of Korea in 64, one uh, economic journalist in a very famous uh, economic uh, journal was saying uh, 64, 64 uh, South Korea is a very poor nation and uh, a number of miracles as well as a good judgment and a lot of work would be necessary to uh, provide this country with a viable sustainable economy. Uh, so it was necessary to have a number of miracles, a very good judgment, and a lot of works. Uh, Taiwan was uh, then very fragile in front of the uh, communist China in the 60s. Uh, Singapore, Singapore became, uh, which is now Singapore, the richest country in Asia uh, in 65. Singapore was super, uh, move away, a kind of Singapore exit uh, from Malaysia. But uh, Singapore was not viable at all. It's notably, uh, Singapore has had no water and had to import its water from, from Malaysia. And the picture in East Asia was effectively very, uh, very fragile. And uh, there were uh, it, it's true that there were no reason to consider uh, um, an optimistic or a positive future for, this, for these countries. Uh, at this period, um, at this period, uh, Rosenstein Rodon um, calculated uh, gross, estimated uh, gross prospects for a number of developing countries. And you can see that in, in, uh, in white, you have what was uh, effectively realized, uh, the, the achievements. Okay, in, w in white, you have the achievements. And in black, you have what um, Rosenstein Rodon um, projected in, in 61 for uh, the next uh, 15 years, okay? So the projection prospect uh, 15 years later. And you can see that for most of uh, what, for, for most of, this of these countries that um, a few years ago will, will become part of the miracle, of the Asian miracle, uh, the prospective growth was quite low. Huh? Taiwan, for instance, Singapore, uh, Korea, while countries such as Myanmar, Birmania, Burma, uh, India, uh, sorry, uh, or the Philippines of Pakistan were considered having much more growth potential. Huh? 
And this is only the picture for Asia. In fact, Rosenstein Rodin had a larger uh, perspective. He, he included uh, South American and, and African countries as well. And it was considered at the time that uh, the country that would uh, grow fast or faster than the others uh, were the country with a big with big size and with a, str uh, a large, a large, uh, a large uh, supply of, of raw materials, huh? of raw materials. Uh, so in Africa uh, and in South America, the prospects were much more positive, especially for large countries such as Nigeria, uh, Argentina. Uh, Kenya and so on. But as you know, in fact, uh, the story has not has not been uh, has not been this one, and this scenario was already rather uh, false in most in most cases. <coughs> and these small countries, such as Singapore, Taiwan, or Korea, without any uh, uh, any um, uh, resource uh, and a very small domestic market and no specific uh, resource or advantage were considered uh, very badly. Bon, but in fact, these countries were the ones that grew the faster. So just a picture to show you the structural change process uh, in a few East Asian countries in comparison with the DC average, the developing country average in, the, in green. So the first uh, graph is on the share on the agric agriculture uh, value added in the GDP, and the second one, well, the title has disappeared, but it was on about manufacturing value added on GDP. Okay. Well, just a few countries in order to have something um, readable, and uh, it's quite the, the, the difference in terms of structural trends is quite obvious. Uh, East Asian country uh, change much faster in terms of uh, structural change and especially in terms of um, manufacturing growth. Uh, while and it, it, it's not uh, at all something systematic. Uh, the average in green shows you that in fact, on average, it hasn't changed during the last uh, 50 years in the developing world. So the, I don't know, it's not the, the normal trend, but the average, at least the average trend is no change, no change. Um. <coughs> and, uh, and if you make such kind of comparison, uh, uh, bilateral with a few number of countries, you have the same starting point until the end of the 60s each time. Uh, so the level of poverty, uh, the, uh, the economic difficulties, the lack of capital, uh, the lack of technology, the lack of export capacities, uh, the lack of uh, manufacturing development and so on were rather the same almost everywhere in the third world. Uh, in, South, in, uh, in East Asia, in South Asia and in Southeast Asia as well, and in Africa or North, or North Africa also. Right? It's the same, the same starting point. I mean, and if you compare also the institutional uh, conditions and a lot of uh, factors, roughly you have quite uh, similar pictures uh, in this country. But after that, it changed. Right? So the question is, what happened? What happened? Miracle, chance, luck. Or uh, is it possible to, to, to find out uh, a more structural explanation, a model behind this fast growth? Huh? Um, in fact, the story can be uh, summarized like this. Uh, uh, we'll detail a little bit later. Uh, a very, a very uh, strong uh, rate of investment in the manufacturing sector, uh, strong manufacturing investment, which was promoted, uh, subsidized, uh, assisted, uh, and so on by the state. And last point, but I will not uh, develop this way, this one. 
the, the, the use, the general use, the general use of uh, strategic uh, uh, shortcuts such as export rather than use the domestic market, such as import technology rather than redevelop re the complete uh, the complete set of technology, uh, the use sometimes of foreign investment in order to speed up both the rate of investment and the technological level, etc. Uh, etc. Et um, I will more focus on the role of the manufacturing sector and the role of the state in promoting the manufacturing. Uh, sorry, the manufacturing sector. We uh, couper <laughs> the manufacturing sector because uh, the, the the main reason behind the growth of the GDP per capita level, the, the growth of the income level in this country, is here. Uh, it's the growth of the manufacturing sector. Um, alors, at first, at first, this uh, takeoff, this takeoff, where uh, presented or where uh, described, or the term used was miracle. Uh, the first one was the Japanese miracle. Uh, the rebuilding of the Japanese economy in the early fifties uh, uh, was considered as a miracle because Japan was considered destroyed. It was a uh, uh, it was late, a late comer already in the manufacturing world, and so on. Uh, in the, in the, um, and then, then the, the the miracle term was uh, used as a generic as a generic term as a generic term to uh, describe uh, uh, to name all this uh, takeoff in East Asia. So after Japan. South Korea and Taiwan, also Hong, Hong Kong and Singapore, but they were, uh, they were smaller, so it was less important. And <coughs> so poor countries with a very uh, strong pop uh, population density, no resource and so on, but growth, so it's a miracle because they had no big market size or big size at the beginning, they had no resource, they had no uh, technology and so on, so their growth was considered as a miracle, and the term was finally uh, um, crystallisé, um, uh, well, definitely used in this uh, in this uh, World Bank report uh, that tried to summarize this growth process, and which was called uh, the East Asian miracle. So, <laughs> a little bit uh, uh, contradictory and an oxymoron, which say in French. I don't know whether it's in English, meaning that. You have 300 pages that we, uh, which aims at explaining you this growth process, but it's a miracle, so good luck. And one of the uh, first implications of the, of the consequence of the use of this uh, word, uh, word uh, uh, miracle is, as I said before, that in fact um, a miracle, a miracle uh, cannot the, the, the way to build a miracle cannot be explained. Uh, cannot be explained. A miracle, you can only wait for one. And if you are lucky, you got a miracle. If you are not, no miracle. That's all. Uh, it means there is nothing to learn from a miracle. Uh, there is nothing to learn from, uh, from the miracle. There is no uh, policy lessons to identify. There is no uh, lessons or policy measures to transfer uh, to other countries, and there is nothing to pick from my record. Um, that's a very uh, strong, uh, strong uh, explanation of our consequence. Uh, and the most uh, dangerous uh, dimension is the non-replicability. Uh, the non-replicability. It's unique. It's unique. These people are lucky, but uh, there is nothing to use from this uh, from these experiences. And um, this view, <laughs> this view, this miracle view, uh, has been, uh, let's say, shared both by the right or and the left. I mean, both by the neoclassical uh, by the neoclassical economist and by the post-Marxist economist uh, for different reasons, for different reasons on both sides of the, of the, of this continuum. 
on both sides. In fact, uh, these uh, new industrialized countries' experience was considered as unique, exceptional, and so on. Okay. The ex so the, 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 uh, the reason of these uh, exceptional uh, processes were not the same, <laughs> of course, in the neoclassical paradigm and in the post-Marxist view. Uh, but in both cases, it was exceptional. It was exceptional. I think there are some slides here. Voilà. Alors, I'm sorry, some of these uh, quotations are in French. But uh, the, first, the first one, uh, uh, Sachs, in a famous OECD report, was saying there is no, uh, there is no room for other Japan or other uh, next countries, uh, um, dragons, because they are so vulnerable uh, in uh, due to their, to their uh, dependency to, to, to export and uh, industrialized countries' market. So it can, they cannot be presented as a model to be followed by other countries. Okay? They have been lucky, they have benefited for a very, very uh, particular uh, state of the world, um, economic, uh, international economic rules, openness of the American market, the Vietnam War, or you can mix everything you want in this kind of explanation. But the context was exceptional, and that's why they uh, succeeded. Uh, th that's, that's why they succeeded. Uh, and this uh, view was uh, uh, also proposed by different authors. I, I haven't uh, quote all of them because they are too numerous, using different kind of exception. Uh, for but the, the, the openness, the openness of uh, the world market was considered as something exceptional. Uh, so in the 80s, the 90s, the very wide openness of the world market was one of the main reasons of uh, both the successes of these countries and the fact that they, are not, uh, they cannot be replicated. Uh, because as you know, the uh, world market has, uh, has been closed now, uh, especially for Chinese export or other uh, countries' export, which is not true. Uh, so for Cummings, it was also exceptional. For what? For wait, sorry. Was more, say still on the left side. It, and he published uh, one of the best books on these experiences. But still, he concluded that it cannot be reproduced. Why? In fact, nobody knows. Uh, there, was <laughs> there was no strong reason between this, this strong conclusion that it, can, it couldn't be replicated. Uh, it was a, a one-shot, a unique experience. Each experience was unique, so you have a sum of uh, unique experiences, but uh, no, uh, um, no model, no, nothing to, to replicate. Sometimes, sometimes also, uh, the Confucianism factor was used uh, to consolidate this view that this Asian experience were very unique because of Confucius. Okay. In Brazil or uh, in Nigeria, people are much less Confucianist. That's, it's, it's sure, but it doesn't mean anything. Uh, et on, let's say, the neoclassical side, on the neoclassical side, the move was a little bit more uh, clever. Fin, clever. Uh, it was a little bit clever. And the experiences and the successes of these countries. Now, just to give you a, a, a figure, I haven't wrote it, but during this period, uh, from 60s to 2010, to 50 years, GDP per capita in South Korea and Taiwan was multiplied. GDP per capita in, in rural terms, uh, in PPA, was multiplied by 20. Okay, in 50 years, GDP per capita multiplied by 20. In comparison, uh, in Thailand it was by 10. In Brazil. Nobody checked before, but in Brazil it was by three. Uh, and in a lot of developing countries it was by less than three. So uh, the growth process was really, really fast. Bon. Uh, and this, uh, this experience were very, uh, was quite uh, interesting for, <coughs> uh, for theorists in need of uh, illustration of case studies <laughs> Uh, demonstrating their, the rightness of their view. And the, uh, the on the neoclassical side, it was more um, this perspective that was, uh, that was dominant. Um, so at first, at first, because of uh, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and so on, uh, were exporting much more than the other developing countries. 
And because the size of the state in terms of direct involvement in the, um, uh, in the production systems, uh, they considered, or they tried to present, or they tried, they presented this experience as a neoclassical model, uh, as a liberal model. Uh, for instance, um, the Westfall, Westfall uh, um, citation was quite, uh, quite interesting. Uh. South Korea followed the, its, its comparative advantage and then it grows according to uh, Ricardo, uh, the Ricardian theories of comparative advantage, that's all. Okay. Belasa, uh, Belasa and others uh, opposed countries such as uh, Korea, Korea uh, sorry it's in French, uh, Korea, Taiwan and so on to uh, countries where the state direct involvement in the, in the, especially in the industry, was more, much more important, and that it was true that well, in Taiwan it's not not completely true, but in South Korea, in fact, uh, the, the state uh, companies were not numerous, and the size of the size of the state was not really important in terms of budget, in terms of uh, uh, number of, of officials, and so on, in terms of. Uh, tax level and so on. Um, so it was at first presented like this and then a, a number of studies, uh, the Wade uh, studies, uh, the book from uh, Amazon, uh, The Next Giant, but a lot of, of studies in the late 80s, early uh, 90s, uh, analyzed this experience and showed that in fact the, sta the state was very interventionist in these countries and uh, they were not at all um, uh, implementing uh, free trade policies. They exported a lot, but they had, and in many cases they still have, very uh, strong uh, protectionist barrier, uh, for especially for consumer goods. Well, so they were not really um, uh, free, free trader, neither uh, not interventionist countries. And then, the, let's say the storytelling was, uh, was changed in, in, the second f in the second phases. Uh, the uh, neoclassical explanation first tried, it was a good try, but uh, quite um, courageous, saying that, all right, the state intervened a lot in these countries. The state was very present in investment targeting, in credit uh, allocation, in uh, technological imports in, uh, and so on. But in fact, uh, the, 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 the result, the outcome would have been better without the state intervention. Okay, we accept, we accept, it's true. The state was very interventionist, both in Taiwan and in Korea, as well in Singapore, for instance, and Malaysia, Thailand, and so on. But it would have been better without the state intervention. Why not? Why not? But it's not really, really strong. It, it's not uh, really strong as an explanation, especially because there is no, um, in the history of economic development, there is no uh, example, there is no case of a country that uh, had such a fast growth during a number of decades, uh, roughly uh, 30, 35, 40 years, at a very uh, high growth rate without state intervention. And there is no uh, counterfactual. There is no example. The only <laughs> example that could have, have been used, but in the not really, uh, it, not, it would have not have been coherent with this view. The only example would, could have been China. But it's difficult to consider that Chinese growth has been um, implemented without state intervention. Huh? So you can consider also that it would have been better in China if the state has uh, reduced its uh, intervention uh, degree level before and so on. But uh, in fact, nobody knows. Huh? It's not very strong. So the second view, the second view it's more, is more interesting. The second view, which is uh, the main message, uh, message um, uh, provided in this, uh, in this book, is in fact the state uh, intervene, but in the sense of the market. Huh? Implementing and uh, designing market-friendly policies. So 
you have a strong intervention level of the state, but in the sense of market development. Okay? Uh, and then, of course, it's more acceptable. However, difficult to, to, to accept this, uh, this view, especially since you look at what happened uh, next, this kind of uh, confusion, uh, general confusion about this expedition. Uh, just one quotation, uh, another one after that. Uh, so the, the two first page, <laughs> the two first page of this report start like this, uh, start like this. All these experiences are very different. There is no model, first, first sentence. And uh, next page, they all use the same policies. So there is no model, but they all use the same policies. Huh? Uh, and this, um, and this uh, imbalance as is, let's say, the most common view among the neoclassical economists. The most common view, and just a late example, Unfortunately, even a very, uh, a very relevant economist, Nobel Prize, like Krugman, uh, continue, continue to sell the same story. The same story. In his uh, famous textbook, I don't know whether you use it, but you should, uh, if you have been interested in international economics, there is a chapter on the East Asian growth. And the conclusion is, Nobody knows. <laughs> Nobody knows. Huh? There remain considerable disputes about the reason. We don't know. We don't know. Uh, this is, and he, he could have believed that at one time he wasn't sure. Uh, but uh, and it, it's only a conclusion in the very old and obsolete edition. No, it's the same in the new one. You could have a look if you check. And so I haven't uh, looked to all the edition. The version, but uh, he, he kept the same conclusion. In the French one, it's the same. Uh, it exists a vif débat quant aux raisons. A vif débat, it means we don't know. Uh, we cannot give uh, an explanation. We don't know. Um, so you have one Nobel Prize, and uh, Opsell was, or still is, I'm not sure, the chief economist of the IMF. Those these two highest ranking, two of the most uh, um, famous economists in the world. They don't know how the only countries that developed during the last 60 years uh, have done. They don't know. That's what they say. It's difficult to believe it, come on. <coughs> Et so far, if you, if you have a look at the uh, usual uh, neoclassical presentation of this experience, uh, it's rather in phase, uh, rather uh, uh, coherent with, uh, this, uh, with this kind of conclusion, uh, with this kind of conclusion, which is basically, uh, conf uh, which, which sell com basically confusion. Uh, there has been success, but it's not clear why. Maybe because of the state, because he was uh, very uh, present, but it's difficult to be sure, and so on. Uh, if you look at this experience more in detail, uh, 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 what uh, is uh, impressive, the, the major difference, is the rate, is the rate of investment. Uh, so FBCF uh, means um, uh, gross investment, huh? gross investment on GDP. Uh, the, uh, as you know, FDI. But, uh, just to show you those three countries here: Malaysia, Korea, Thailand. In the, all the three countries, in all the three countries here in color, uh, you have a fast rise of uh, the investment rate. Okay, in comparison, in uh, in black, uh, the average developing country level, which is rather flat as well. And just to uh, Mm, avoid uh, bad interpretation, bad explanation. Of course, there has been FDI in these countries, but as you can see, uh, the share of the FDI in the total investment is rather low. It's rather low. In fact, South Korea was very protectionist against uh, FDI, such as uh, Japan. Taiwan, a little bit less, but still. 
uh, the South uh, Thailand as well, uh, the more open countries to, to foreign direct investment were uh, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, and of course China now. Uh, but the other uh, developed almost without foreign direct investment. Uh, they used mostly um, licensing, uh, sorry, licensing agreements, imports of technology, and so on to upgrade their, technolo their technological level. Uh, the picture on the right is just to show you that China is following the same very uh, a strong investment pattern. With, uh, so it's difficult to, to estimate because of the Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, accounting system, public accounting system. It's difficult to estimate the gross investment uh, ratio in China. So there is max and min. However, in terms of volume, uh, it's a lot of time bigger than the investment made in the manufacturing sector in the second, uh, in the second uh, manufacturing country in the world, the United States, for instance, or if you compare to Germany or all other uh, important manufacturing producers. So uh, the, the base, the base uh, behind this growth development process is a strong level of investment in the manufacturing sector. Et, bon, so the question is why in these countries you have had such a, an important investment in the manufacturing sector and not in others. Uh, Korea and Taiwan, Taiwan a little bit, uh, but Korea, uh, Singapore, we are not rich at all in terms of uh, private capital available, in terms of um, attractiveness of foreign capital or foreign or, or, or uh, of foreign uh, flow of, um, uh, so they were not attractive at all. So why there and not in other countries? The main reason is, uh, is the role of uh, the state and its capacity to implement industrial policies. Industrial policies have been implemented in all developing countries, but let's say that in East Asia, they were a little a bit more coherent, more effective than in other developing countries. It doesn't mean that everything was uh, perfect. Uh, there was no mistake and so on, that's not the case. But on average, on average, on average, uh, the, um, the industrial policy implemented in, in uh, East Asia were much more effective than uh, in South America or in Africa, for instance, uh, with a few mistakes as well. Um, uh, ouais. And bon, just pas le temps. On verra après. Okay. Uh, so this industrial policy uh, had um, four major instruments because uh, first, maybe uh, mm, ouais. uh, a few words about the need of uh, industrial policy. Um, in fact, the question whether a developing countries uh, late comer need or not industrial policy is not a good question. Very um, can be explained very, very uh, rapidly <laughs> by the fact that consider that you have two sectors. Okay, in the Lewis uh, dual dual sector approach, you have two sector. One which is known by all uh, the entrepreneurs. Uh, you know the profit rate. You know the risk. You know the technology. You know the market and everything, which is roughly the agricultural sector, okay? You know everything about it. And you have, uh, you have the prospective growth sector, the new sector, the modern sector, for which the uh, local entrepreneurs have no technology, have no cap usually not much capital, uh, no experience, they don't know the market, um, they have no support, they don't, don't know the profit rate, they don't know the risk of failure and so on. So the question is very simple. Why would an entrepreneur move from a well-mastered uh, uh, economic sector with a, um, a good rate of profit move to a new sectors about, about uh, for, for which he doesn't know anything, especially the risk of investment. So you can have a few very um, adventurous uh, entrepreneurs that decide uh, to, to move to the new sector, but on average, the probability to have a, a strong uh, structural change and, and reorientation of the investment, the private investment from the old sector to the new, new one is very low. Okay. 
This is why you, know you need uh, the state intervention uh, to reduce the risk, to uh, share uh, the investment, to provide some subsidies. Well, there are a lot of tools that can be used, but without state uh, involvement, so industrial policy, it's uh, very improbable to have a, a fast, a strong a structural change from um, a low risk sector to a very high risk <laughs> uh, sector of investment. Huh? So that's the reason. But then the question is how to be effective, huh? how to promote effectively the change from the old low productivity sector agriculture to the new uh, high productivity sector industry and within industry to the highest uh, value added uh, sectors. Huh? So the question is not really whether EP industrial policy is necessary or not, it's necessary. The question is rather what kind of industrial policy or, or how, how to implement it and how to make it uh, uh, enough uh, effective. Voilà. In Asia, the experience of this country shows that they used a combination of four categories of, of, uh, of instruments. Uh, four categories of instruments. Uh, with various uh, success. I mean, the, the, the rate of success or the performance were not all the same. It's not homogeneous, of course. But in, in all, all the East Asian countries, from Thailand to uh, Japan, China, or Korea, and through Singapore and Malaysia, Malaysia, you have the same instruments. In some cases, they worked better than in others, that's all. Uh, and the first, uh, the first, uh, uh, the first, uh, sorry, <laughs> the first tool, uh, the institution, institutional tool was uh, the concentration of uh, the planning decision process uh -huh. within one single or a small number of agencies. Uh -huh. uh, this was it was the role of the very famous uh, MITI, so Ministry of Industrial Trade and Industry in Japan during the 60s and the and the 50s. In Korea, the major implementing agency uh, of, the, of the planning process of the, of the manufacturing promotion process was the EPB, the Eco Economic Planning Board, and so on. So you have in China now, it is the N NDRC, which is the main uh, actor of the, of the um, industrial policy implementation. Uh, <coughs> in all countries, you have had one or two sometimes major uh, implementing agencies. It is very different from uh, other countries. If you look at Brazil, for instance, uh, or a lot of African countries, Morocco and Tunisia, Tunisia less, but Morocco, you have a number of ministries of promotional agencies uh, working on the FDA attractiveness and the export promotion and so on, so which have basically a function to promote the manufacturing, uh, manufacturing investment and um, manufacturing activities, but uh, disseminated, in, uh, disseminated within the institutional framework of the country. Uh, so first, uh, uh, this uh, concentration of the, of the tools, and where in the countries where it was the most successful, in fact, these agencies were extremely prestigious, in term, uh, notably in terms of um, uh, uh, recruitment target for for the for the young um, uh, for the young student coming out from the university system. Uh, the first choice in Korea, for instance, during the 60s, the 70s, until the till the end of the in the, the 80s, the first uh, the most prestigious job for the um, young graduates was the EPB, or the Economic Planning Board, because of the power they had the prestige of the job, the salary were relatively high, but uh, mostly because of the prestige and the, and the power. Second uh, important condition, if you want to uh, accelerate the structural change from low productivity sector to higher productivity sector, you need to have an investment capacity, okay? And in poor countries, it means uh, in general that you need to have an influence or to control uh, part or uh, in total the banking system, the banking system. If you have already a lot of private capitalists, it means that in most cases you are not any a, any any more uh, a poor developing countries. So uh, 
in most of these countries, either the banking system, the private banking system was uh, controlled by the state or the state was able to influence strongly the, the credit allo allocation of the banks. Huh? So it means that, in fact, the banks were used as uh, tools of the industrial policy, uh, directing uh, funds, channeling funds to the project, uh, the sector, the industries that were considered as strategic. Uh, so in, in Korea, shipbuilding, then uh, cars manufacturing, then electronics, and so on. Uh, in Malaysia, same process, etc. So, uh, and it was, uh, uh, a rather powerful tool because, because of the rate, the very high saving rate uh, in these countries. Uh, the high saving rates allowed the bank to collect a lot of funds that were able for, uh, for investment, uh, for investment uh, after that. Yeah? No, no, no. We maybe we discuss that after, but yeah. basically the, the the saving rate in uh, you start with with country with which were rather unsafe and unsecure in the late fifties uh, during the fifties roughly because because of the Cold War, or the Korean War on one side, uh, Chinese uh, Chinese Revolution plus the Vietnam War that started. So all this area was very unsafe, uh, and for for this it's one of the major reasons why the uh, saving rates were very low. Uh, they were not attracting capital, and the saving rates were very low. Then, with the stabilization, roughly in the 60s, everywhere, almost, you start to have uh, the, the, well, the stabilization to have a Chinese saving rates. So it's more complicated than only a macro macroeconomic um, outcome. It's also in terms of, uh, uh, it's also in terms of uh, how, uh, household uh, management, uh, the way they consider the future, etc. Well, maybe we come back to that later. But uh, so the second component is uh, is the availability of this uh, banking uh, of these bank uh, credits for manufacturing investment. Huh? Third component, which is uh, very important, well <laughs> this is just to make the comparison with another institutional system. So investment investment is necessary to have a fast uh, growth and a structural uh, change, but it's not enough. You, can, you have also uh, countries that experienced very high rate of investment, of manufacturing investment, uh, that led to nothing. That led to nothing. This was the case, for instance, of the great uh, leap forward in Maoist China, uh, with a rate of investment uh, in a red here that grew uh, to 40% of the GDP uh, in the late 50s. Okay, but you can see that at this time, the, imp uh, the impact on the growth rate was catastrophic. Okay, so you have a very strong investment rate, but a very negative impact in terms of growth, and generally it was a catastrophe. It was a catastrophe. So what is necessary to correct, uh, to, to, to use more, uh, in a more effective way as a huge investment in the manufacturing system. Uh, this is the limit and the, and the weakness of the industrial policies. Is you promote investment in the manufacturing sector, but how, um, how do you uh, manage or introduce um, uh, some uh, management component in the industrial policy system in order to, uh, to select only uh, the most effective project and not to finance everything. Uh, so the, the question is how to select the most effective project. And it's very difficult because, of course, um, industrial policies is about the future industries. Uh, so it's, a, it's a prospective view. So you consider that in the next 10 or 15 years, this sector, this industry will be the most important. But uh, difficult to be sure, uh, difficult to be sure. One uh, tool that has been very well used in Taiwan, in Korea, in China now, but less in Southeast Asia, is the export, uh, is the export incentive, as uh, the export discipline. The export, uh, of, uh, the, the 
East Asian experiences on the export side are often presented as the use of export as, um, as a huge uh, leverage uh, in terms of market size. Uh, and in fact, it was rather open because in the 70s and the eight, even in the 80s, there were not many countries, developing countries, that tried to export. Uh. But in fact, the most important, the most important um, uh, effect of the export orientation is that it increases the return of industrial policy because if firms, uh, if producers are um, pushed on the international market, they cannot only um, benefit from protectionist rent and they have to improve their competitiveness in order to reach, uh, uh, to reach the international level in terms of competitiveness. So the export discipline and the export orientation is a tool to select, to select, let's say, the winner among uh, the project and the firm that benefit from uh, investment support. And it's very important because it's a way to avoid, to avoid, uh, in most cases, white elephants and ineffective, uh, unproductive uh, project. Uh, bon, je plus le temps, alors on accélère. It's just the, the fourth component. The fourth component, so is a package uh, with a number of additional, additional uh, measures to stimulate uh, the manufacturing sectors, in which trade protection is very important. It uh, has been used everywhere, so it's quite interesting to see China now presenting uh, itself as a new um, as a new support for free trade at the world level. Well, in fact, uh, the trade policy in China has been very protectionist and still is very protectionist uh, against, especially uh, consumer goods uh, imports, uh, subsidies, bon, uh, support to technology development, uh, including subsidies, including, including uh, the building up of science park, of scientific, of uh, technological park, and so on. Okay, L last question, uh, last question. Bon, I, I didn't know how to, to translate uh, the French version of the sentence, uh, but these states that implemented this industrial policy and this development policy quite effectively in East Asia were often uh, named as strong states uh, in, opposition, in opposition to weak states. But in fact, uh, in most of these countries, uh, the states are less strong than they were. Uh, they are they're less strong than they were, uh, not only because they have been victims of their success. Uh, the private sector in Korea, in Taiwan, uh, in Thailand, in Malaysia, the private sector has grown, and um, the, the, um, uh, the capacity of mobilization of influence of, of, the, of, the, of the private sector is much stronger than before, especially in terms of financing. The large uh, Korean, Taiwanese, or uh, Thailand, Thai multinationals, they don't need so much uh, the domestic credit system. Uh, they, can, they can collect funds at the international levels and they're much more independent than before. And, well, let's just move to the third point, which is not uh, the end of the story because there are still, uh, of course, um, a question mark on this on this issue, but also there has been a wave of democratization uh, in these countries, and uh, a lot of these uh, state governments that were very, uh, very, uh, very strong, very um, stable, but not democratic at all, had to share had to share the power. Uh, in Korea, in Taiwan, in Malaysia, in Thailand. So sometimes you have. Um, you have a kind of U-turn in terms of uh, democratic transition uh, in Thailand, for instance. But roughly, uh, the state, uh, the state uh, strength had been a little bit diluted in the democratic process, which is not uh, finished yet. Okay, I stop now, maybe. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. 
Uh, thank you, Professor, for your presentation. I think it was interesting to follow, and uh, students from different options could uh, find something specific for them, they, what they um, can refer to. Um, we would like to change the slides. Yes. We would like to present our outline. So our presentation is divided into eight main topics. Um, of course, the topic is very broad, and we would like to concentrate your attention on um, some most uh, striking uh, facts and information and uh, empirical evidence. So we are going to um, take a look at literature overview, um, talk about main economic indicators, uh, discuss public financial banking and investment policies, um, talk about the issue of regional integration and production networks, um, give some idea about industry composition in these countries, expert dynamics and give some conclusion. So first of all, literature overview. Um, Many scholars uh, talk about physical capital as um, the main um, source of economic growth, as um, it's attributed to capital accumulation and um, to um, uh, total factor productivity. So there are works which discuss the measuring of total factor productivity and the specificities of technological process in these countries. Also, uh, scholars uh, concentrate on the role of the governments in these countries, uh, on um, um, exp expert promoted technology on um, um, subsidies as well as um, um, lowering interest rates and also development of human capital in these countries. Uh, we are talking about very various development strategies as Professor already mentioned. There is no single scenario, there is no uh, single formula which can be adapted for all the countries. So it's all about unique experience. But um, it's, uh, there is something in common and uh, this common feature is the link between trade and growth. So all these um, countries are outward oriented. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna pass, I'm gonna pass fast here because uh, Hip also presented. The only uh, different thing in the graph that we wanted to include also the developed countries. Uh, so you can see that um, Korea and Taiwan uh, as a GDP per capita already catch up with uh, Western Europe, but it, they are um, still uh, behind uh, US. And there is similar graph that he presented showing that comparing of countries in the 50s and 60s that w had the same GDP per capita, uh, you can see a sharp increase from uh, Korea and Taiwan. Also, uh, we put the GDP average growth. I I made an average of decades, so it's uh, better and yeah to visualize. Uh, you can see that if you compare with the developed countries, uh, Korea, uh, it's at least five percent uh, average GDP growth uh, comparing with the developed countries. But if it, if you look in the region, Asian region. Uh, actually, it's not that uh, clear. Uh, China, uh, after the 80s, uh, 79, uh, Pearson has the best average rate of GDP growth. Um, for talking about um, public and financial policies. We have chosen the case of South Korea and Taiwan since they have some similarities and some differences. First of all, um, in both countries, the state uh, had an active role um, in composition and allocation of private sector and investment. Uh, it subsidized um, industries um, and uh, we may say that um, the strategy which was implemented for subsidizing was more about picking winners. So there were some domestic contests and um, the winners were mostly picked, so there was no, let's say, competition there. Um, in the 20th century, both countries did not have a strong industrial base, um, and uh, many, in, in, um, in, um, it benefited a lot from the U.S. economic and military assistance after wars, uh, and as well, um, these countries did not um, um, did not 
tried to innovate, um, didn't try to innovate themselves um, in the initial stage. They tried to um, imitate technologies. They um, used licenses, and uh, Japan was the main source of technological transfer that time. Uh, so, if we are talking about um, the industrial approach of South Korea, for them is bigger better. So few highly centralized conglomerates called Chaebol are engaged in broad range of production activities. In Taiwan, the strategy is different. Uh, smaller is better. Taiwanese government uh, is taking responsibility for a um, range of activities which are hard to implement for small and medium enterprises. In these activities, we include um, research and development, market research, training, ch channeling technologies to private firms. Also, government encourages small and medium enterprises to um, be uh, fast and flexible and get the niche position in the market and be involved in regional production networks. So uh, talking about uh, some public policies of uh, Korea and Taiwan, uh, I'm going to uh, focus and uh, 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 Professor Lauti uh, already mentioned uh, the the banking investment uh, policies, but we're gonna give some more uh, inside information and more uh, specific information about uh, both uh, Taiwan and Korean uh, strategies. So uh, Korea, uh, Taiwan had a more the direct control of the banks while Korea uh, just uh, assured majority of the, uh, the biggest uh, commercial banks. Also, uh, the uh, allocation of credit, uh, as he mentioned already, was the, the main uh, industrial policy in Korea, uh, while Taiwan uh, had more uh, exchange rate control and limit in, uh, inflows of portfolio investment uh, as as measure of uh, policies to uh, influence the investment rate uh, they adopt different strategies so uh, Korean uh, uh, chose to use more the finance incentives while Taiwan more uh, tax incentives uh, so Korea used more direct credit investment and also uh, was a really important uh, measure was the social risk sharing where the government would bail out uh, entrepreneurs investing in desirable activities. So uh, the government uh, had a really, really uh, direct role in deciding and choosing uh, what, uh, what investment was uh, the, the country was willing to, to do. Uh, Taiwan, on the other hand, using tax incentives, uh, you can see that in the uh, 1960s there was a statute for encouragement of investments, so uh, tax on enterprise came from 32 to 8%, there was tax holiday on new investments from 3 to 5 years, tax free for undistributed dividends, tax free for product re real estate. Uh, so here is the investment share of GDP. Uh, here, uh, it's because um, a lot of uh, articles and authors say that th the main factor was export-led regime, and while others say that the export-led regime was a uh, a consequence of the rate of investment. So you can see that uh, comparing with the countries that had this uh, in 60s similar investment share, uh, Korea and Taiwan uh, increased a lot during the years. Also compared with uh, developed countries here, you can see that uh, there is at least a 20% difference of investment share of GDP. So here is like to understand like why the why the 
uh, investment was so high in those countries. So here I, I got for Korea uh, the interest rate on bank loans uh, for general loans and for uh, enterprise that were exporting and the rate of return of fixed assets for manufacturer sector. So here it's easy uh, to understand how profitable was to invest uh, and how cheap was to borrow. So you would, you would borrow uh, with an interest rate of 16 and you would invest and the return would be 32, so uh, double. Uh, and if, if your company was uh, to export, it would be four or five times more profitable to invest on uh, manufacturer sector. So uh, also uh, another uh, policy was the macroeconomic. Uh, another macroeconomic policy was the real exchange rate, and you can see that uh, it's really stable. So when you're planning investment, uh, this is really important having a stable and not only stable but appreciated exchange rate. So uh, the their cur uh, currency was devaluated and but I mean here like you can see that uh, between 67 and 85 the Korean exchange rate was reportedly the lowest among the 95 developing countries and you can see that Taiwan has the same pattern. Uh, also uh, I quoted uh, here the, uh, from uh, Lao Tse uh, the actually the the orientation toward uh, exportation was not uh, optional was more imperative so here is just to vi visualize uh, the change the structural change by the expor exportations so you can see the increase of more high and intense value added pro products uh, especially electronics, machinery, uh, and so on, ships, shipbuilding also increasing, and the less value-added uh, products uh, decreasing al along the years. Um, the next uh, issue I'd like to raise is um, global production networks and regional integration within the region. First of all, just to give a um, small overview about um, historical background, in 1970s, 1980s, there was a stagnation period for these countries because the countries um, were um, not integrated in regional and uh, were not regionally connected to each other uh, and mostly inward oriented since the markets are small they uh, suffer stagnation in the 1991 um, in the region and uh, within the countries uh, starting of course with the asian tigers a new policy look east policy was adopted so um, it led to a market opening and um, economic integration between south and southeast asia uh, in recent period, um, it is interesting to look at uh, cross-national production networks since uh, the ability of countries to join regional division of labor and to um, encourage technology transfer, to uh, encourage um, uh, value-added industrial development is a key to success. Uh, the role of MNCs is um, very important here because several MNCs, multinational corporations, established ex extensive production networks in Asia and um, since it's um, contributing uh, not only to development of um, the countries which get federal direct investments, it also um, contributes to the regional integration in production and trade. Uh, th these networks are um, stateless, cross-national, and um, include global development process. So it's interesting that um, these production networks influence internal politics as well. 
Uh, here on this slide you may see the uh, free trade agreements uh, starting 1991 when the East um, policy was implemented, when the markets got open. Um, so there are a lot of signed and uh, implemented agreements nowadays and as you may see um, a lot under negotiation and uh, on the um, stage of proposal. Uh, here we would like to demonstrate a case of a uh, large multinational corporation, career multinational corporation Hyundai, and its um, production network. You may see it's um, uh, widely um, integrated within the region, so uh, research and development is conducted in China, in um, Korea, in Japan, while assembly plants are um, installed in Indonesia, Malaysia and Vietnam. So um, this is how labor division uh, is going on um, within this multinational corporation, how it's being implemented. Um, industrial outlook. In uh, 1963 to 1980s, the rising industries were in apparel electric machinery. But uh, since uh, the country was devastated after the Korean War, um, these are um, the, uh, the information about Asian tigers mostly. So textiles and rubber were declining. In the uh, 1980s, um, non-electric machinery appeared and textile stints um, existed in the country but was declining even more. Nowadays, in, the sou in South Korea, steel, electronics, shipbuilding and automotive are the leading industries, while in Singapore and Taiwan, um, we are talking uh, if we are talking about all this Asian tar target, we are witnessing um, uh, a shift from labor intensive uh, to capital intensive um, industrial structures. So for Hong Kong, it's financial services, trading and logistics. Uh, for Singapore, it's electronic chemicals and uh, pharmaceuticals. For Taiwan, IT, optoelectronics, machinery and biotechnology. And here I would We'll go here very fast because Professor Hall already mentioned it. Uh, the uh, sectoral composition in these countries, um, so um, very low uh, share for agriculture. Um, it, they all are service economies, and um, the people are mostly employed, of course, uh, in services and industrial sector. Um, okay, as um, you can see on these graphs, um, the Asian tigers are uh, spending a lot of money on um, R&D. Um, here on the first graph, uh, the upper graph, you may see that Korea is the leader in uh, uh, expenditure. It has the highest percent of expenditure for um, of percent of GDP, so it's about four and a half percent, and. Um, on the uh, graph below, you may see that the highest share of uh, R&D expenditures goes um, from the uh, business sector, not from the government. Okay, going to the conclusions, uh, we also put the phrase that uh, Professor debate uh, during the, the um, seminar, uh, that that Korean and Taiwan cases were a miracle, so it's hard to, rep to be reproducible in terms of economic policy, each experience reveals its own history. Uh, so th the, the conclusion would be, maybe it's not about uh, reproducing exactly the same economic policies, but understanding the, the role of the, that uh, government can play uh, in, in planning and building uh, strategic uh, plans to achieve uh, economic development and also that the the importance of uh, trade and in, uh, investment and also the connection between trade industrial policies and the connection between uh, the public policies in general and the planning of uh, the economic policy also uh, a focus on export and the importance of uh, exportation as well. And just a few questions to finish. F to finish, uh, we would like to 
uh, understand better what the changes in the international context uh, actually impact in the perspectives for the uh, uh, less developed countries uh, now uh, to achieve uh, industrial industrial uh, to achieve industrialization and uh, yes, and the second quest question is devoted to uh, regional integration. Uh, since historically the Asian governments took uh, a very active and promotional role in development, um, nowadays due to the integration in global production networks, um, the role of governments um, seems to be less visible. We would like to know what is the new role of the state in the era of regional networks. Thank you. The question is, the, 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 of course, your last question is the right one. <laughs> it's difficult to answer, but we can try to find a few, um, a few comments. Just, I would like to, co to come back to the question of the export, investment, export, and so on, because the, uh, it's often presented this experience as a way of, um, of, a, of a growth based on export orientation. So the, basically, the story behind is a the, 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 the world market was very open. Thank you for, to the CIA, the US uh, trade uh, policy, and so on. And because of this uh, exceptional openness of the uh, American market, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong were able to export then to invest and to grow, and end of the story. But of course, now with Trump and already before, uh, the openness of the American market and of the world market is not uh, the same. So not impossible to duplicate a uh, end of this export oriented uh, growth. Well, do not forget the Chinese experience huh? because after uh, what I, I, I sh showed you before, uh, after Korea and Taiwan success, uh, the, the explanation was the same roughly. Now the world has changed, it's no more possible. And then arrived China uh, who basically used the same strategy, the promotion of a targeted sector, the use of uh, common resources and credit to promote uh, strong exporting sectors and to uh, expand its production on the world market. So of course, China is unique, that's true. But does it mean that after China, there is no other possibility for a country to develop in the same way? It's a different conclusion. So uh, every experience is unique, but it doesn't mean that as uh, basic uh, engine or components or strategy used cannot be uh, duplicated in an adapted way. So uh, this is a picture, well, you can read it. Uh, on, the, the on the manufacturing sector, uh, still be between uh, 67 and 2000 uh, and something. Just to show you that in fact, this growth of East Asia, uh, East Asian economic development was basically the growth uh, of East Asian manufacturing export, excuse me, <laughs> manufacturing export, uh, in uh, on the world market huh? on the world market and it started with the korea taiwan and then it continued the question is was it the engine the export orientation and then of course the, the, the other side the openness of the of the of the um, of the world market or was it the outcome of a domestic strategy that gave uh, the domestic producers the, the, the capacity to uh, to export so in the Roderick paper, it was one of the, 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 the start of the 95 Roderick paper. Of course, if you, if you, sorry, sorry, uh, if you, uh, sorry, if you export, you, uh, you benefit from higher uh, income, you can invest, produce, and increase your export, so it's a cycle. Huh? But the question is not whether it's a, uh, it's a cycle, uh, but whether where is uh, the starting point? Uh, from where a, 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 um, a development policy should start? From the trade policy side, huh? uh, pushing its, uh, its producers on the world market, opening the domestic market to avoid rent-seeking behavior and so on. So is the 
trade policy is the most important one or the starting one, or is it the industrial policy or the, or the investment promotion uh, uh, policy the most important? And the question then becomes in Korea and Taiwan, who started uh, this process, uh, what, was the, uh, what was the beginning? Investment growth or export growth? Was it investment that led to more, uh, more uh, larger production than this product had to be exported because the size of the domestic market was very small, huh? small countries, low income in the 60s, or the export orientation that induced, that induced a higher investment huh? uh, because of the incentives of the market prospect and so on. If you look at uh, South Korea and well, this is Malaysia, just to, sh to show you that it's not uh, uniquely the first, uh, the first generation of new industrialized countries such as uh, Korea and Taiwan, but it's a case also of Malaysia and it's a case also for China. In fact, so in green, in green you have the investment uh, rate, investment on GDP, uh, and in red the export rate. Okay, and you can see that in fact, boy, if you look. <laughs> If you look uh, closely to the graph, you can see that the investment rise uh, um, happened before the export growth in each case. Uh, in each case, so it means what? It means you have first a new capacity to invest in the manufacturing sector, coming from where? Nobody knows, but roughly not from the private sector, which was uh, without capital, without technology. Uh, completely averse to risk, so it was coming, and not from FDI as well, because at this time no foreign companies was ready to invest in Korea divided or in Malaysia uh, split up with Singapore. So the only uh, source of fund was the bank system with a strong or less strong influence from the state. Okay. There is no other source, there were no other source for investment. And after that, the export. Um, mechanism, uh, the export mechanism uh, was developed. But it wasn't very easy. And in it, each case, it was after the investment push. So it was rather investment push than export led. Of course, it was both. Uh, but the first uh, impetus, the start, uh, was given by the investment push. Alors, if you use uh, econometrics uh, to demonstrate that it's quite difficult, uh, because you have the both, both result, both, uh, both uh, growth at the same time. Um, how to differentiate it? So in this very simple way, or to look at the micro, at the micro level, uh, this is the case of the South Korean, uh, South Korean uh, automobile industry, car industry. Okay, so nothing in the IT, nothing in the IT, and very uh, large already in the late 90s, and then it continued. Okay. And you have two curves here, two bar. Uh, what is one, the first, uh, the, the black one is the capacity, so the cumulated investment, uh, cumulated investment, the number of factories. And the gray one is the pr real production, okay, the real production. And you can see that I in Korea, uh, you have almost what will be called in uh, Europe or in Western economies, overcapacity. Over capacity, meaning the production capacity was far higher than the real capacity. Okay, each time, each year, you have a, a gap between the an, a large gap, 40 percent, 50 percent, 30 percent, between the production capacity and the real capacity. Okay, but if you look uh, in a dynamic way, so <laughs> if you compare one year with the with the following one, in fact, you can see that the gap is reduced. If the gap is reduced, for instance, here, you have a 40% gap, but the next year, the production has increased by roughly 30%. So if you compare this, this bar with this one, the level of overcapacity is quite small the next year, okay? But uh, in the same time, so only in 87, in the same time, the Korean car makers continued to invest. But in fact, the overcapacity rate was still high. So it's a, a, a kind of investment push growth. Huh? Every year, every year they were making new investment, even uh, in this situation of, uh, where they had already uh, capacity in excess. But for the Korean, they don't, the Korean economists, if you <laughs> go to SNU, you will discuss that. Uh, they were, 
they were calling that not over capacity or excess capacity. They were calling that capacity in advance. So we produced, but the market was not, we produced for the market, but the market, international market, was not already uh, informed, <laughs> was not already informed of the new opportunity to buy our cars. So roughly, we were producing, uh, we were expanding production. Uh, they, they got a lot of cars at the end of the factories, <laughs> shipped to where they could be sold, uh, where they could be sold. And of course, they were exported because at this time, uh, the, Korean, uh, the Korean consumers uh, had not the average income uh, that, that could uh, allow them to mass uh, consume uh, cars. And, and in, in the Chinese case, it's the same. Uh, if you look at the sectors that were targeted by the Chinese industry, you have this uh, uh, production uh, capacity uh, expansion before the export expansion. And after that, if it's a success, of course, it's, it becomes uh, uh, linked. Huh? Uh, why? A about the saving, uh, saving uh, the question about sa saving and, and the what um, uh, the link between the, the macroeconomic uh, balance and the saving rate ratio. In many countries, it was the case of Korea, it's the case now of Vietnam, for instance, which is following, is more modest, more discreet than China, but it's Vietnam is following rather the, the, the same way. Uh, the trade balance is negative. Uh, it's negative. They are exporting a lot, but they import more. They import more to, to speed up their uh, growth process. Uh, what? I missed something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. And my name is Hayom from Option B. Uh, I just would like to know uh, your opinion about the uh, multinational corporations or the FDIs. Uh, some studies, they show that the uh, FDIs uh, usually, or most of the time, it has positive effect on the economy of the country. But at the same time, there are other uh, studies that show that it has actually, neg at some point, it has negative effect, especially on the poverty or inequality of the country. So I would like to know your opinion whether the FDI has positive or negative effect on inequality and poverty of the country and how. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think yeah, you can always uh, measure uh, an impact or between FDI or relation between FDI and uh, the change in poverty or inequality in a country. But uh, in fact, so the, so the explaining factor is not FDI in most cases. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's intermediated by the income structure and uh, how the wealth is distributed already in the country. So as far as FDI promote growth, they should reduce inequality in a country on average. But of course it depends how, uh, how the wealth and how the income is distributed in the country. You know? so there is no in the case of China, for instance, you have a strong correlation, of course, between the growth of FDI in China and the growth of inequality in China. Uh, but is it due to FDI? It's difficult to conclude. Huh? Um, in the other way, it's, it would be quite, um, uh, quite uh, improbable that in a country without any FDI, uh, inequality will, uh, will be reduced except in a very poor country. Uh, in, in Maoist China, of course, there were no FDI. 
the inequality was very low. Everybody was very poor. Donc, um, as long as you have a growth process stimulated by FDI or other engine, uh, the, the, the income level and, and the inequality uh, will extend. But, um, it's uh, not enough to consider it as a positive or negative uh, consequence. Good afternoon, I'm Leila from Option C. Thank you very much for your presentation. I would like to ask you um, what size, uh, what, what's the average size of the companies that this, all these cases you presented were supporting, basically saying if, if they were supporting mainly small and medium enterprises, as the case of Ta Taiwan that the guys show, mm -hmm. or it was more based on big companies or state uh, enterprises? Because now it's again, the, the, the debate is coming back, so should we fund uh, small and medium enterprises or uh, move to big who, companies? Who is saying that uh, state support should go to large companies? Nobody? For example, Masukato is making a case in, in the UK for the, the new industrial strategy and she's saying that the UK and, and Europe in general sh should stop focusing that much in small and medium enterprises and move to bigger companies. That, that okay. would be one case. Thank you. Well, the experience of uh, the case of Korea and Taiwan, for instance, it was said uh, during your, your presentation that uh, Taiwan, for instance, uh, used smaller is better or something like that. Uh, the basic, uh, the basic st uh, economic structure in both uh, countries was very large uh, conglomerate uh, chambers in Korea and uh, small and medium sized companies in, in Taiwan. But this is the result, let's say, when they already um, uh, took off uh, in, the, in the 80s, for instance. At the beginning if in, South, in South Korea, in the 60s, there was nothing. There was nothing, almost small or medium sized uh, companies. Uh, and the way uh, the state, the way the chamber were created or were expanded, uh, basically they were chosen, a, a dozen of companies were chosen in the early uh, 60s ap after the military uh, coup in, uh, in Korea. And uh, the state, the state, the mili military state uh, imposed to a the dozen of the companies that were considered as the biggest, as the biggest at this time, they were kind of a deal. Uh, we, we will provide you with funds and advantage and, uh, and, and support as long as you invest in the manufacturing sector. And since then, in South Korea, that's a, the problem of the Korean economy, uh, uh, since then, despite a lot of small and medium promotion, cooperation, plans, small and medium specialized credit scheme and so on since the 70s, uh, in fact, the growth has been concentrated growth, but mainly because the resources, and especially the financing resources, were uh, channeled mainly to the, towards the large companies. But at the beginning, they were not large, okay? And they expanded very fast. This is the South Korean story. But there is still a strong need in South Korea of <laughs> helping, assisting, uh, modernizing the small and medium science company, because most of the manufacturing uh, employment in Korea is in the subcontracting and uh, small and medium sized sector. In Taiwan it was different, but mainly for a political economy reason. Uh, when the Kuomintang uh, reached uh, Taiwan uh, in the late 40s, the Kuomintang has a very centralized economic model uh, with very large state companies that were dominating the big eight, so energy, uh, uh, cement, and so on, these this industries. And in fact, uh, the, modern, the modern sector, the modern sector, electronic, uh, for toys at first, toys, text, garment, electronic and so on, uh, was available only to uh, small companies because the large companies have a very uh, strong rent-seeking position in the system. And you have, uh, if you look at the, at the statistic on the Taiwanese case, the, the share of the large companies decreased when the Taiwanese economy grew. But not because the large companies were failing, just because uh, the growth was uh, coming from the small and medium sized sector, especially the growth of export. A and the new sectors were uh, invested by this uh, more dynamic uh, sector. 
And after that, as you say uh, rightly, the state provided a strategic, uh, strategic resource, especially a technology resource to these networks of small and medium companies that were because they were not able to, to develop um, uh, costly, uh, costly uh, uh, technological components uh, for the laptop, for instance, for the machine tool and so on. I don't answer your question because I don't have the answer. <laughs> okay, I'm Benedict from option B. Um, I have three tiny or smaller uh, follow-up questions and then kind of one debate question. Uh, so first, let me start by the, the, the smaller ones. So. They're all about kind of the framing of these miracles as miracles or mysteries. And so the first thing that I was asking myself, looking at the quotes uh, of these very famous economists from these very powerful institutions, and they're saying this, has there, has there been any substantial debate, and by substantial debate I mean a debate in journals that have a certain standing in the world in the economic in the world of <laughs> economics between these large actors and people like Ha Jun Chang, for example, who also has a quite famous name. So has there been any engagement between these people? Second, has there been any engagement of these economists with economists from the nation states in question? So when they say, Oh, it's a mystery, nobody knows, have they asked people from economists from South Korea? maybe, which then ties into my third question. Have they talked to the governments of these countries and asked uh, their opinion? Ju just one point after you finish. Yep. In fact, they, 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 knew, they, they knew the story. They, they are saying that they don't understand and they cannot explain it because it's not uh, compatible with the, with the basic uh, neoclassical framework. That's the reason. That's all. But the, the Krugman is a very is a very f clever guy. I mean, there, there is no reason to believe that he doesn't uh, understand such a process. Yeah. I, I get that. I just, what I just want to know, and you seem to know the literature, is have they actually, I'm pretty sure they understand <laughs> and it's like it's an ide ideological frame and I, I, I mean, that's very, very clear. But I'm trying to find out is if there is any debate, if there's any substantial, uh, exchange between people we don't know, uh, do they then, when they say we don't know, do they then allow people like Ha Chun Chang, people from the government well and the region into their debate? Well, it depends. But there has been period during which uh, these debates were more uh, intense than, than now. But um, each time, I mean, the, the, this kind of view, the, this uh, synthetical, <laughs> synthetical neoclassical explanation uh, has been uh, provided at the end, uh, finished with that. So about the debate, there has been a lot, especially uh, between Hedjong uh, Chang and uh, Justin Lin, the former, uh, the former um, uh, chief economist of the World Bank, uh, about especially about industrial policy. Uh, but as you know, in economy, you can always uh, find facts that, uh, that support your view Mm. Uh, and you can oppose to alternative facts. Uh, so, um, it's not really difficult. The point, the basic point, <laughs> I'd like you to understand, but I do uh, as, you, as, you, as you wish, and maybe I, I'm not enough clear, is the only part of the world where you have had a very strong uh, development, uh, economic development, and it's not at all a mirage. I mean, it's decades, r uh, three and a half decades on average of growth, uh, very fast. Uh, it's East, East Asia, and the common point of East Asian growth process is the state intervention in order to promote to promote selectively uh, number of industries. That's all, and, and you have no uh, alternative uh, development uh, uh, experience to to balance with this East Asian way. And no, it's not the case in, in, Latin, in, in Latin America and Brazil is like this. Uh, no, in Africa, nowhere. Um. Yeah, thank you. I think, yeah, I mean, I agree with this fully. And so, <laughs> so thank you, thank you for the, the, these answers. That so at least there's some kind of debate, but it's always very interesting. Uh, and then, kind of a 
more provocative question that I wanted to throw at you, and that's about the savings. I mean, you stepped here into kind of this post-Keynesian uh, nest, so it was clear that this question will come, I guess. Um, the, so uh, you present, maybe I misunderstand, but the way that I understood this, you presented it that the causality or one of the causalities for the development and the investment runs from higher savings rates, which are now possible because oh no, more fact, stability. Did I misunderstand? No, that? no, it, I, I, I didn't explain it clearly. Please continue. So my question now is, isn't it more reasonable to say that the stability and the development of these countries then enabled the higher savings rates instead of saying the higher savings rates enabled the investment? Because if you say it, the causality no, no, runs right. from savings, you're right. you have a loanable funds model and then right. uncomfortable. Well, what I wanted to say <laughs> is was that, in fact, the high saving rate was were an additional uh, strength and component uh, uh, after the takeoff to sustain to sustain the growth process. But at the beginning, it's rather effective, as you said, it's, it's more institutional stabilization and the, the investment orientation that creates your port more, more saving. And if you take the case of Korea, Korea is a very poor country, and in terms of uh, uh, balance of payment, it has, uh, until, the, the, until the, the late 90s, it has always been a poor balance of payment. I mean, with trade deficit, with the need to borrow abroad uh, in order to, to finance to finance its uh, manufacturing investment and so on. But Vietnam, now, uh, in 2017, Vietnam is roughly in the same case, uh, trying to, to maintain a high investment rate with a, with a high uh, saving rate, but not enough, and uh, borrowing abroad or uh, trying to attract foreign investment to increase its investment rate. <laughs> May, well. But also, you can consider, should consider that in the social system in East Asia, there is no, uh, there is no uh, welfare state. Uh, so you have, the families have to uh, build their own uh, savings for, especially because in many countries, the cost of the, of the children's studies are very high. Pardon. Hello, I'm Brenda from Option A. Um, thank you very much for the presentation, very interesting. Uh, I would like to ask about the role of uh, companies in the, inter inter uh, the internationalization of companies and how the role this played in the development uh, of these countries and especially the role that the, s the state played in fostering this internationalization of companies. You mean the, 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 the domestic companies yes, going abroad. moving international or the foreign no. companies? Uh, Domestic companies going Moving international abroad. In terms of investment or exports? Both? No, in terms of uh, setting subsidiaries abroad. Investing. Principally investing. the uh, investments maybe in developed countries. No? Mm. D but in, in most cases, the state has not uh, been, uh, was not a strong support of, uh, of, foreign, uh, of foreign investment. Uh, so there were policy in the case of uh, inflows uh, for, for multinationals investment within the countries. But uh, the policy towards uh, the foreign investment of the domestic companies abroad, uh, as far as I know, there has not been. Is, is this the case, the same in China now? Uh, you can see that the Chinese government is not very uh, comfortable with this uh, expansion of uh, Chinese company abroad. Not, it's, it's in most cases, well, maybe I missed the point, but I don't think it was part of the uh, industrial policy or state strategy to to ex to um, uh, to help or to assist uh, the domestic companies to to expand abroad. In most cases, it was a rather <laughs> private move. Uh, hello, good afternoon. I'm Julian from Option B. Uh, so I have, I think, two questions, but now I cannot forget one, so I will do just one. So how much shall we emphasize this um, when comparing the East Asian strategy, let's say the Asian tigers with Latin America, it's usually emphasized that Latin America focuses focus too much on import substituting strategies while East Asia do it on oh. export oh. Uh, promoting. So how much shall we emphasize that difference? 
and how much shall we emphasize the, let's say, state discipline in terms of forcing firms to achieve export surpluses as a condition to grant them right. be, new be benefits? Cautious because you, you tend to assimilate export orientation mm. and export successes, meaning uh, you can find uh, Korean, uh, Korean uh, electronic products on Western markets with uh, trade surpluses. Mm. In fact, especially in Korea, different for Taiwan because of the specific uh, status of Taiwan uh, uh, in the world order, but especially in the case of Korea, they exported because they, uh, they have been trying to, uh, to, to increase their export in order to reach the import level. And in almost all the uh, economic history of recent Korea, uh, exports are running behind the imports. Okay. Bon, of it doesn't mean there has, there has been no successes, huh? mais, mais in terms of trade balance, I think the first years of, uh, of uh, a trade surplus, it's at the end of the 80s. Huh? And it's mainly because of the yen, uh, the yen uh, increase, and the yen DACA. So the yen became very, very expensive, and the Korean product became much more competitive in relative terms uh, at the end of the 80s. But otherwise, they, they, they run rather a trade deficit than a trade surplus. But in terms of import substitution and export promotion, in fact, everywhere in, a in Asia, uh, they use the same, roughly the same uh, import substitution incentives and schemes than in uh, Latin America, than in North Africa. The difference is not on import substitution. That was a very strong part in Korea, in Taiwan, in China. No. Uh, it the difference was the export orientation. Okay, so, and sorry, follow up on that. So we should uh, emphasize also the um, how do they achieve to finance those deficits? Is that important? Uh, <laughs> they struggle. <laughs> they struggle. I mean, South Korea was uh, one of the main uh, was uh, one of the main victims of the banking crisis of the 1981 because of the huge external debt, huh? but it was mainly because this debt was, has been used before to finance manufacturing investment, but when the interest rate rise and so on, uh, the, uh, the South Korea fall down in a, in a financial crisis in 97. In 97, during the, what is called the Asian financial crisis, in fact, you had mainly four countries, not all Asia, but four countries that fall down, including <laughs> including Korea, because they borrowed a lot. So uh, they struggled. I mean, it, was, it wasn't as easy as the curve uh, can show you now. The, the very uh, cautious country is Taiwan. Mm. Taiwan had no external debt, has run always a, a strong trade surplus, has built very huge external change reserves very early and so on, because of the diplomatic status of Taiwan, mainly. Huh? But the other, they, they run uh, very strongly. And China, at this level, is more uh, oriented like Taiwan in terms of, uh, in terms of external dependence. And just look at the level of the, of the external reserves of uh, China. Right? It's just a, a, ground, a, a guarantee against any uh, balance of payment crisis. Um, you're done, right? Um, my name is Eric. I'm from Option A. And I guess I wanted to offer more of a comment um, for the presentation um, rather than a direct question. Um, just to move beyond the binary of the investment led and then the or the export oriented strategies. Because I, th I think um, coming from the region itself, there's an increasing recognition that a lot of the policies, um, a lot of those industrial policies have pursued um, a do have maintained the dual character of export orientation and um, investment strategies. And I guess my question uh, leads to how does the aspirations of upgrading within the value chain fit into those um, two strands of understanding of these East Asian miracles? I mean, particular emphasis on Taiwan, for example, when they started to participate in producing LCDs and now they're producing laptops of their own through Acer and the like. So. I guess that's the question. Okay, wait, thank you. J just about export and investment. 
let's say that export orientation is uh, is is a uh, mean to um, to increase to improve uh, the investment returns. Uh, it's uh, it's that that, that uh, there is a strong linkage in terms of uh, investment performance. It's a way to guarantee or to maximize uh, the investment returns um, because. If you export, you need to be competitive, so you need to improve your productivity and technology and so on and so on. So it, it's linked, in fact. It's linked. And the difference with uh, Latin America or other countries, or the, the picture I saw you on the Great Leap Forward in China, is you can have very, have very high investment rate, but if there is no strong incentives to use uh, this period as a, as a period of uh, technological productivity and so on improvement, you have very huge uh, white elephant, but uh, inefficient. But uh, in terms of emulation, it's one component, of course, uh, both within each of these countries and uh, at the regional level, and the competition between uh, electronic producer in Taiwan, electronic producer in, in Korea, in Japan, and so on. So you have two components. You, you have, a, 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 let's say, um, a wave, uh, a wave uh, dynamic process. Huh? Uh, Vernon product cycle, roughly. I mean, from starting from Japan, that sold its uh, older technology to steelmaker in Korea, and then steelmaker in Korea sold that to a steelmaker in Thailand or in China, and so on. So it's a way to diffuse the growth process uh, with a little bit emulation, but not so much more cooperation. But also, you have a co uh, strong competition within each country in Korea within the chambers, there have been a very strong competition in all of the successful uh, sectors of the Korean economy, and in Taiwan as well. But Taiwan is more, um, it's less, at the beginning at least, when the companies, the producer was still medium-sized, it was less competition than uh, uh, shared, uh, shared uh, uh, learning uh, process. Roughly, when they one company identified a new niche product, starting with a keyboard, for instance, in the uh, in the computer industry, and it works, it starts to export. Then, in the next uh, semesters, you had a dozen or twenty new keyboard producers in in, in Taiwan huh? because they, they understand that the technology was relatively simple to learn, the market was wide. And uh, if uh, one company was able to produce that in a competitive way, the same company, if the same company, a company with the same assets and the same skills and so on, could do the same. And and you had this uh, this uh, uh, diffusion process in the Taiwanese industry, in the bicycle industry, then in the uh, scooter industry, uh, and in the computer industry, starting from keyboard and parts to the wall uh, to the wall computer. So it's more. It's emulation, but it's rather diffusion, uh, spillover, diffusion, and so on. Because in fact, the competition was not within uh, between the company on the domestic market, but much uh, more on the international market, which, in comparison with the size of the Taiwanese producer, is uh, unlimited. Huh? Okay, uh, thank you. My name is Jinan. I am from Option C. Uh, I have a question regarding the. Um, learning by doing a process. I think uh, highlighting East Asian countries as a success story is really important and there are many lessons to learn from. As you said, state intervention policies, of protectionism policies is the most important thing. But I think there is a third element which is mainly learning by doing, which it takes a very long time and it's long process. And I think this is one of the most uh, important elements that many developing countries are really lacking is that the issue you have a uh, technological and a skill gap between between the developed countries and developing countries. So the learning by doing a process, it takes really time and I want to hear more about this. No, no, you're right. It's a, it's a, it's a barrier to entry or to, 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 to manufacturing development. However, in, in East Asia, you have had also a, a, diffusion, a technology diffusion process. Uh, firstly, without FDI. I mean, the, in Korea, for instance, the Japanese engineer from Toyota or from Sony were traveling in Korea during the weekend to help, far too well. Uh, they were paid huh? to, uh, to, to work in Korean factory uh, to, to help uh, the Korean to um, implement the production chain and so on. And after that, if you go in Vietnam or in Cambodia now, you will see that in the, tex in the textile industries, you have a lot of Taiwanese uh, supervisors 
and uh, Korean supervisors who manage uh, the production process. So there, is, there has been a, always a, a diffusion process, uh, inform, un, sometimes formal through FDI, but also very informal. Huh? <coughs> then, so the, 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 the question of the learning by doing process it's, it's maybe may change because of the fragmentation of production process and the new, uh, uh, the new lengths of the global produ production chain because it's much more easy now to start with a small part of the production process than before. Uh, so it means that you can start and capitalize on the competitiveness of one electronic component or two and then expand if uh, you have more investment resource. To c it, it modifies a, a little bit the, the, the opportunities. There are, there are more opportunities now than before uh, uh, for this side. But you're right, the learning par by doing it, <laughs> is there, is it's there is one dimension which is has been uh, masked in my presentation and also in your comments, which is key to understand also this uh, growing, fast growing process. Uh, it's the investment in education, uh, investment in ed education in all East Asia and also if you compare to other developing uh, region, in all East Asia, the average uh, individual investment or household investment in education is very high, uh, is very high. Um, so it means that in terms of um, uh, technology absor absorption capacity, you have a very uh, strong basis, uh, even if technological level is low, but the absorption capacity is potentially strong and, and it has been uh, uh, shown. I mean, uh, this is the case now in China. Uh, you can see that uh, they are upgrading very fast their uh, technological level through the import of technology, but the import of technology is efficient only if you have a, a strong enough uh, technological base uh, and skills within the country. You, know, you, can, uh, you can say in the this kind of, of technology in Cambodia or, or in Bangladesh, uh, I'm afraid the result, the outcome would be very different, even with the same uh, input of foreign technology. So we can also summarize the growth process in East Asia, saying that people invested in education, and because the level of education were, was high, they were more able to seize opportunities, and they more, were more able to increase their productivity. Not okay. Hi, my name is Maria Mehmed. I'm from Option A. Um, I just want to highlight one thing in terms of developing countries. If we talk about development, it's very important to highlight the factor of politi uh, politics here. For example, as you exemplified Pakistan, in 60s, in Ayub Khan's regime, Pakistan had one of the highest developing economies in the world. But suddenly, um, it was very politicized because at that time, we had this building of uh, silk route between Pakistan and China. We had building of different dams and stuff in Ch uh, Pakistan. But as soon as um, Ayub Khan's regime moved out of Pakistan, all the development projects ended and Pakistan then had to face a very big lag and the bubble actually burst. For, so for me, it's very important to define development just not in terms of GDP, but in terms of um, uh, hu uh, human development index. Is Dr. Mehboobul Haq in his um, one of his conferences when he was talking about and when he was introducing HDI index, uh, human development index, he talked very uh, very clearly about this. Uh, like we shouldn't talk about the development of Pakistan in 60s in terms of GDP because this created a lot of disparities in the economy, and uh, rich got richer and the poor got poorer and people had to commit suicide as the bubble bursted and there was a, a large rate of mortality after that. So I think it's not just GDP that is required to be the proper measurement of development. If we need to measure development, we need to focus on other indexes too, like human development index, education index, like GDP is not the, just enough measure of development, especially in terms of developing countries because it's just so politicized development that as soon as the government moves on, development is gone. Well, of course you're right, but uh, difficult to have a growth of HDI without the growth of GDP per capita. I mean, you're right, development is cannot be reduced only to a trend of the GDP per capita curve, but without the growth of the GDP per capita, you can have no more investment in education, in health and basic health and so on. So, of course, but... Um, the, the HDI is 
kind of very strongly correlated to the GDP per capita variation. The main difference is the life expectancy, which is roughly uh, information about the degree of inequality in the, in the economy. Now, I said, oh. I agree with you, but difficult to improve uh, health, uh, education, and so on level without. Um, Tes courses. Tes courses. Tes courses. Tes courses. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, hello, my name is Vinicius from Option C. Uh, it's always interesting to uh, talk about East Asia and their development and trying to escape and trying to catch up. But if we look uh, closely to their economies and their politics back then, uh, they had a strong state and it was driving the, the catch-up process and the development, but they were also, as far as I know, uh, dictatorships or highly centralized governments as China is right now, as mainly um, Brazil was in their development uh, process in the 70s. And uh, this always, uh, it's always this uh, discussion between democracy and development. And uh, this, at least in my opinion, uh, tends to this um, kind of pessimistic view that that right now it's even harder to reach this strong state uh, with democracy and especially now in, with globalization and financialization. So I would like to hear your comments on this. Uh, if it's possible, I know it's a very hard question, but if it's well. possible, what what, what's your intake on this, uh, mainly because you studied uh, East Asia, et, et cetera? I, w I would like to be able to generalize about the relationship between uh, GDP per capita growth and democracy expansion and so on. Uh, you will get the answer in a few dozen of years. Dozen of years. Uh, in the case of South Korea, Taiwan, for instance, as you said, in fact, uh, there were roughly dictatorship uh, during the takeoff period, the 60s and the 70s. But in the 80s, they moved to democratization very fast. Very fast, so there are different ways of uh, evaluating the, the, trueness, the trueness of the democracy process. But in, in South Korea, for instance, in uh, 10 years, they have already uh, had the, uh, the, the, uh, the initial uh, group in power, so the, the candidate of the military, and then the historical opponent and then the second historical opponent, all, all of that in, in 10 years. In France, in comparison, from 658 to, uh, to, eight, nine, to 81, it took uh, 25 years. So a very dynamic democracy in a very short period of time. And it had no impact or it had, um, did not uh, reduce the growth rate. Huh? And Taiwan, the same. So it's difficult to... Um, to pick, uh, to pick uh, lessons from these experiences. Um, the main problem now is China. <laughs> if you look at the world without China, or well it's difficult, of course, especially in economics, uh, if you look at the world without China, the answer roughly is more uh, development in, sense in the sense of um, uh, less poverty, uh, but higher GDP per capita, you have more democracy. You have more democracy roughly because it's when the people have a, a good um, uh, income level, they are, uh, they are requesting progress in different dimensions, in human rights, in, uh, in uh, uh, civil liberties, and so on. Bon. With, with China, <laughs> which is keeping a very authoritarian state a structure, it's less obvious now. But I bet, but of course I'm not sure, that in 20 or 30 years, uh, the, the, vi the vision and the picture would have changed because China will move. Uh, nobody understands truly now why China is, is able to keep its uh, form of state despite its very strong growth rate. Uh, and uh, s in if you come back to HDI uh, view, uh, Sen was uh, saying that uh, there is no reason to compare or to um, or to look at a linkage between democracy and development. Um, democracy is part of the development point. I mean, it's an easy, easy way not to answer your question. <laughs> I, I, 